Let's turn first to Samuel Coleman's farmyard. Coleman is one of the first artists to come to out to the East End on the Long Island Railroad. Coleman was part of the Hudson River School, a group of artists who were influential in creating an American approach to landscape while embracing elements of European Romanticism. Coleman paints cityscapes and landscapes and later in life collaborated on interior design with Louis Comfort Tiffany. Coleman most certainly was influenced by Thomas Cole who emigrated to the United States and was profoundly influenced by the worst effects of industrialization and struck by the contrast of the wild and beautiful countryside surrounding his childhood industrial town. The ideas of natural beauty juxtaposed with man-made environment are so clear in Cole's Oxbow. Look at the left, side, the left side of the canvas as compared with the right, and check out those storm clouds over natural beauty. The palette has a somber feel, and the power of nature and God are reaffirmed in markings on the mountain that some historians read as the Hebrew word, Yahweh, the name of God. Now, let's turn back to Farmyard, East Hampton, 1880. What is Coleman trying to tell us through his painting? What do you see and feel as you look closely? Here is a quiet farmyard. Hens and goats in the foreground are undisturbed. There's a sense of calm, but also of tension. The trees so prominent are dark and are covered by threatening clouds, a bit reminiscent of Cole's Oxbow's left side. What is this symbolism? We see farm buildings, but no house and no people. As in Cole's piece, this is about nature and a bucolic way of life that is on its way out. The blue sky on the right, midground, highlights what looks like a cross above the barn perhaps a refer reverential symbol of God, the creator of all nature. The paint is rich and saturated with deep colors. What time of day do you think this is? Twilight? Fading light? What is the symbol symbolism Coleman is suggesting? In this lovely and quiet painting, the artist may be telling us about the twilight of an age that is passing a somber moment to reflect on when one way of life gives way to a new age. One more question to ponder before we look at our next piece. Those tracks in the foreground, are they symbols that lead to this old way of life or a way to a more industrial future? The second piece we will share is by William Merritt Chase. Um, we'll first take a look at, yes, first we'll take a look at this piece. Chase is very special to our museum, and we have a wonderful archive of information about him and his work. Chase worked in all media, but most especially in oil and pastel. This iconic Chase painting is the Bayberry Bush. Chase was a cosmopolitan man, a family man, a teacher, and a well-respected artist whose portraits were highly desirable among society figures in his time. He's well known for his landscapes, which are considered American Impressionist masterpieces. People are fairly prominent in Chase's landscapes. Here we see beautifully attired children, Chase's own, um, picking berries in Shinnecock Hills, where Ch Chase and his family spent summers from 1891 until 1902 while he taught at the Shinnecock Hills Summer School of Art. These works are some of the finest examples of American Impressionism. Chase stages his scene to bring us a view of a high lifestyle in a gorgeous location. These works are characterized by loose, loose brush stroke, brushwork, and strong color, featuring both scenes of daily life and landscapes. 
they were generally painted in plein air. This style flourished in the late 19th to early 20th century, especially in art colonies in Long Island, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, and California. American Impressionism shared techniques with European Impressionism, but it focuses more on America's success. Remember, this is the end of the Gilded Age. Today, we'll take a trip just a bit away from the East End into Brooklyn, to Prospect Park, to be exact. Next slide. Nope, yeah. After Chase married, he moved to Brooklyn, nearby the park, and his first of eight children was born here. Prospect Park made an almost perfect backdrop for Chase. It featured flower gardens, sculptures, structures, and the architecture of homes that bordered the park. Let's take a close look. Chase introduces us to the culture that has emerged, leisure time for the upper middle class or genteel folk. Here we see a well-dressed matron and her child. Parks were not really for work, were not really working class venues as yet. Chase is personally and socially a striving man, and the aesthetics of this milieu appeal to him. The woman and child are dressed for their scroll in elegant attire. The man on the right, likewise, is well-dressed and carries a cane. These folks are symbols of arrival. A ball is abandoned in the grass, and litter reminds us that picnicking was allowed here while it was banned in Central Park. People with time to spare, beautiful parks with flower gardens and sculptural structures for their leisure enjoyment, and in the distance, the reminder that they will return to their parkside homes for a family evening. Barbara Weinberger of the American Wing of the Met says of Chase, he was, and I quote, a gifted witness to his era, gathering impressions of late 19th century life and country leisure to create a distinctive account of his time and place. And so we have peeked into the close of the 19th century, the natural but fading beauty in Pullman's barnyard, and the arrived gentility of Chase's Brooklyn Park. Now let's turn to our last artist, John Sloan, who will introduce us to the change he anticipated or dreaded in the past two works. <clears throat> Sloan, like Chase and Coleman, did paintings that provided insight into the essence of life at a particular time and place, but he represents a new painting's approach, neither romantic nor impressionistic, but rather realistic. Take a look at Sixth Avenue elevated at Third Street while I tell you a bit about Sloan and this style. Sloan moved to New York City in 1904, and was shown in an influential exhibition that opened discussion around this new, gritty, realistic approach to art that came to be known as the Ashcan School. These paintings and painters deal with and reflect a new outlook on life, the egalitarianism of socialism. Sloan began his art career as a commercial artist. His work, such as this piece at the Whitney, is an astute, astute observation of a place and time and stylistically very different from Pullman or Chase. Colors are bold, almost jarring. There is no prettiness to the scene. Instead, it is a noisy representation of life in New York City in the early part of the 20th century. It's full of energy. And the symbol of the elevated train tells us that the urban, industrial, technological age has arrived. But from 1914 through 1915, Sloan spent his summers in Gloucester, Massachusetts, where he painted landscapes in plein air. Let's turn to Hill, Main Street, Gloucester, 1916. Here we see a colorful, more fluid Sloan in an everyday or genre painting. This style is still grittier than Coleman or Chase, more evocative of Van Gogh or the Fauves. 
But in this scene, we can read the massive changes that are taking place in American society. Look closely at the left foreground. We see a horse and buggy, a symbol of a lifestyle on the way out, while center in the scene is the newly arrived auto, driver's evident, and perhaps the driver is even a woman. The car leaves the horse and buggy in the dust, literally as well as figuratively. The birds on the right side of the road look more like pigeons and are definitely not farm animals. And the women who walk the street are a far cry in their flapper attire from the urban mom in Chase's Brooklyn Park. This is a country scene compared with his urban view, but change and modernity are everywhere as trolleys and cars supplant old modes of conveyance and opportunity expands to include women. And so we have traveled from a farmyard in 1880s Hampton to Gloucester, Massachusetts, a countryish escape not so different from the East End in 1916, with a stop in Brooklyn on the way. Much has changed in painting style, outlook, and social life in these 36 years. And Coleman, Chase, and Sloan guide us to a deeper understanding of the revolutionary transformation that's taken place. I hope you enjoyed this visit, and I look forward to rejoining you when the museum reopens. Thank you.